ever just have a game, play a game, and wonder why the heck did this need to be a sequel? You think, with a few tweaks, this game could perfectly stand on its own without tainting the sacred name of its predecessor. And then you remember, oh right, brand recognition. Chrono Cross Radical Dreamers Edition released earlier this year, and well, what an interesting game this was. It's already a dangerous play trying to follow up a legendary game with a sequel. So Chrono Cross is a sequel, but more of a spiritual successor to Chrono Trigger, set in the same world, but a different story altogether. Meet your protag, Surge, infiltrating a tower of dragons. But before he can open the door, he wakes up nearly forgetting to meet up with a childhood friend. They meet at the beach and later Surge hears a voice call to him. The ocean waves rise as he falls unconscious. You go back home and realize nobody recognizes you, or rather, you're dead. You go to investigate your own grave when the dragoons of the Viper Manor corner you, saying that they're on a ghost hunt, and you are the ghost. As it turns out, you were not meant to exist in this other world, and your journey is about finding out why. This adventure leads Surge to confront a fur ocious feline, <laughs> Lynx, with the aid of the spunky thief, Kid. Okay, by a show of hands, who understood Chrono Cross's story their first playthrough? Bonus points if you're an adult. If you raised your hand, I don't believe you. So here's the thing, right? I barely followed the story after a point. Chrono Cross features on parallel universes, and boy, was it all over. I felt like things got left behind, like the poor army or the hatred of humans versus demi-humans, then we got some dragon gods and some other shit I can't touch on without going to spoiler territory, then we play with time skips, 14 years ago this thing happened, 10 years ago this thing happening, just whoa whoa whoa. Take it easy! It wasn't after I dug into forums and watched explanation videos that I started to wrap my head around it. Sort of. And the worst of it all is I like the concept. I'm trying to be vague as possible here, but I like where they were going with the humans versus demi-humans, so to speak, and how Surge is a key piece to that fight. However, the journey was convoluted as hell, and it felt like 15 hours worth of content just hit the cutting room floor. And this brings me to... This didn't really have to be Chrono anything at all. I believe Chrono Cross would have been an excellent standalone JRPG. Rather than using terms related to Chrono Trigger, it should have been its own thing. Usually it's always cool hearing callbacks from previous games, right? It's a hit of dopamine. This is one of the rare cases where it added confusion rather than propping up the story. I do get that Chrono Cross is literally, if this thing in Chrono Trigger didn't happen, the game. Which, cool idea, but poorly implemented. Something that put me off from Chrono Cross was hearing there was little to no grinding, aka no overleveling. And as someone who loves grinding and utterly annihilating my enemies, that gave me some pause. Hearing there was no traditional leveling or experience, I wasn't getting it. Until I got it. Chrono Cross unfortunately does a terrible job explaining its combat system, but thankfully, I'm here to help. Firstly, there are your basic attacks, weak, strong, and fierce, which consume 1, 2, and 3 points respectively. Your max action gauge is 7. A weak attack does little damage but has a higher chance of hitting. Strong attack does more damage but less accuracy, and fierce is heavy damage with the highest chance of missing. How to adjust this is with each successful hit, the percentages go up. So ideally, you want to start weak and gradually work your way up while keeping in mind how much action points you have. Unless you're me, I always go for the fierce attack for better or worse. With each hit, you'll notice your level rise, element grid fill up, and other party members' action gauge restore. The level corresponds to the level of your elements you have access to. The more hits you land, the more your grid opens up, granting you access to higher level elements. You'll notice if you use an element, your level drops. Elements are spells that will cost you 7 action points regardless of how powerful. So however many action points you have, minus 7 to use that spell. If you've attacked even once that turn, you'll be in the negative and cannot do an action until your action gauge has at least 1 point. And it's important to know, you can use each element once per battle. So what this all means is you have to do basic attacks to unleash elements, but also be careful not to leave yourself wide open when everyone's action gauge is in the red. It's a fun balancing act, making it so players can't spam magic, but also rewarding when you land that low accuracy but hard hitting attack. There are more to elements than just powerful spells. Each character has an innate element, white and black, yellow green, and red and blue. Characters are strong against their innate element, but are weak to its opposite. In the corner, there is a field map which changes each time someone uses an element. The more a color dominates the field, the stronger a spell of that element will be. 
Alternatively, it works great as a defensive measure. If someone uses an element opposite of what the field is dominated by, the attack will be weaker. But what if the field is completely dominated? Well, that element will be insanely strong and you'll be able to cast a summon corresponding to that dominant element. So if the field's all white, you can cast a white summon spell, which heals a lot, and in my dumbass case, the enemy too. You can also set element traps, which admittedly I rarely did, meaning if an enemy casts a specific element and you lay down a trap for that specific element, then you trap it and it becomes yours. That about sums up elements in action, but let's talk about prep work. You must allocate elements to your party members. Everyone can use every element. However, using spells that correspond to their innate element, those spells will hit harder. There are levels one through eight. Level one elements go into the level one slot, level two elements in the two slot, etc., etc. You'd think, well, yes, but no. A cool thing is most elements you can place anywhere. So you put a level two element in the level one slot. You'll notice a minus. This means the attack will be weaker, but you'll have access to it sooner. This also works in reverse. Putting a level two spell in a level five slot will make it plus however many slots higher, meaning you'll have to land more basic attacks to get to it, but it will do significantly more damage. Items are also slotted as elements and can be used multiple times. There are some elements or techs that are unmovable and exclusive to that character. And more importantly, something I went my entire first playthrough without doing are dual and triple techs. Yes, they're back from Chrono Trigger. If you have two people in your party who known each other, it's likely they have a dual tech, which means massive damage. This is what I get for sticking with my dream team, Fun Guy and Karsh. My biggest issue here comes from Chrono Cross being a port. The combat lags and feels incredibly unresponsive. I've had to wait for attacks to go through before being able to select another, or switching between characters feels like it takes a second or two longer than I prefer. And I swear, I'm not a frame rate junkie, but it feels like 20 frames per second at times. I love the combat system. Anyone can use any element, any party build can conquer any boss, though optimizing surely would make things easier. I adored the idea of enemies having low health animations. It's great at keeping the player engaged, rather than a mindless button mash. You can run from almost any boss fight, and to my surprise, the leveling system is fantastic. Diving into that, the leveling system is far from traditional. Levels relate to your elements, but true levels are star levels gained after beating a boss. Star levels grant a nice boost to your active party and will raise all grids of characters whether you have them or not. This way, when you recruit characters, they'll be ready for action and not under level. After gaining a star level, there's a set amount of small bonuses you can get by ordinary encounters. Afterward, you'll notice fighting won't grant you any buffs until the next star level. But what you can do is switch out characters and get them those small bonuses. Especially useful if you plan on doing another playthrough with different characters. Character stats roll over if you want them extra beefy for the next playthrough. And speaking of, yes, because this is indeed a chrono title, you can expect to see some elements of the first, like fighting the final boss, at any point in time in New Game Plus, which results in many different endings depending on when you fight it. And no worries, your items, money, characters with stats, and what they had from your first playthrough all carry over with the Chrono Cross, saving you a stupid amount of time, which I did not do. Instead, I started a whole New Game Plus playthrough rather than saving over an old file that wasn't complete. I don't know, the only thing more complicated than Chrono Cross's story is saving in New Game Plus. You can't start up an old save file that's been completed, I don't know, I don't get it. That's besides the point, we haven't addressed characters, have we? Oh yes, there are over 40 playable characters. And I love me some variety, but this brings me to the most frustrating part of Chrono Cross, the missable and arbitrary shit! For starters, a general rule of thumb is if they have a portrait, they're recruitable. Before I continue, some people may think this is a spoiler, so skip to this number right here. It's nothing about the story, but about characters and how you get them. The two characters who seem pretty obvious that you'd clearly get are extremely missable. I'm talking about your childhood friend, Lena, and the pink pooch, Portial. Portial, you have to find a bone under the bed and give it to them. You just have to know that Portial wants the bone because obviously, but Lena? Lena is unforgivable. After going to another world and searching for your grave, Kid comes in. Stuff happens, she has to join. Well, obviously this is the poster girl, so yes, yes, I do want you to join. Congratulations, you successfully locked yourself out of Lena as a party member. 
And if you didn't give Portial the bone, you've missed your final chance to get Portial. And yes, you will get Kid later regardless, but this was the Chrono Cross experience. There's a point where Kid is ill, and you can get an antidote or not. Well, naturally you want to help the leading lady, well congrats. If you help, you've unlocked XYZ character, but now you're locked out of A, B, and Glenn. But of course, my first playthrough, I missed Glenn. By the way, Kid lives regardless. Like damn, can a girl say yes to anything involving Kid? When you get to Termina for the first time, there are three branches, which allow for three different characters. Two of the best and one of the worst. You cannot have all three, which hurts my heart because I wanted Nikki so badly, but I got Guile. I wanted all the sexy characters, you know? And I got Nikki my second playthrough, so. Another thing you can miss is crafting rainbow weapons, aka the best weapons in the game. You can recruit the blacksmith late in game no problem, but you know what's limited? The master hammer. Obviously is the only tool that can make such powerful weapons, but if you don't get it during a certain time frame, buh bye you cannot get any rainbow weapons. Guess you'll have to try your next playthrough. You can even miss bosses. I know I did. Level 7 techs, they are not automatically given. No, no, you have to follow a character's side quest or randomly explore and hope you have the right character in your party to activate something. Or maybe if you're like Lena and you have to answer a few questions correctly in the very beginning of the game, because if you don't, you can't get her level 7 tech late game. Or Razly, the fairy, you know how to get her tech, right? You let her sister die. So, if you're like me, a good Samaritan, prepared to get punished. There's also arbitrary shit like talk to this container four times for an item, bother Karsh 20 times and he'll open a chest for you. My second playthrough using a guide was so goddamn eye-opening, let me tell you. I understand some people hold replay value in high regard. Everyone who chose different options had a unique experience that they'll never forget. And while that's true, I'm an adult who doesn't have time for this shit. I want my favorites and I want them my first run. But as a child of the 90s who had all the time in the world, oh, this would be fantastic. I want to see all the things and play all the characters and have extra fun dialogue. Okay, rant aside, to Chrono Cross's credit, following character side stories and learning about who they're connected with was really fun. And if you're paying attention and frankly saved often, you know who to have in your party during certain events for that sweet flavor text. Also, going between worlds, having characters from your home world and another world interact with one another was a key element of Chrono Cross's fun. A few additions to help smoothen out the Chrono Cross experience is fast forward and for some reason slow down, auto attacking, elemental boost meaning your grid was automatically full, and enemy evasion meaning if you're tagged by an enemy a fight wouldn't happen. My personal favorite. Also, really encourage having the home or another world feature toggled on just to know which world you're in, otherwise you'll have to tell by boat or music. Something new packed with Chrono Cross Radical Dreamers edition is, it has Radical Dreamers, released for the first time officially in the West, which is a text adventure game written by Masato Kato. The point of Radical Dreamers was to expand Chrono Trigger's story, however it wasn't up to snuff for Kato's tastes, and it was scrapped. Fear not, because some elements of Radical Dreamers were salvaged and used in Chrono Cross. Y'all know I don't, uh, really enjoy reading. So while I played about 15 minutes of it before googling the rest, it's about acquiring a MacGuffin. Radical Dreamers is roughly 4 hours and it includes various endings, so if you're a Chrono Nut, this just might be for you. Chrono Cross as a remaster left a lot to be desired. Obviously, everything is upscaled, and looking at things side by side, there is a clear glow up. I will say ports, or excuse me, remasters of old games tend to make their backgrounds look like they're just melting into each other. It's not as crisp as I would like. And while I'm here, Chrono Cross needs to take notes from Legend of Dragoon and add those triangles that show you what is a pathway, because let me tell you how many times I found a new path by hugging those edges. There is a classic graphic mode for ye old purist. I actually like the classic mode a lot. I wish I played the game fully in this mode, and because the backgrounds are all pixelated, the characters stick out like a sore thumb. The downside is classic and new modes can only be changed from the title screen, not in game. Another thing that got a visual upgrade is the art. And I'm torn because I'm so partial to that clean look, bright colors, sharp lines, it's nice. On the other hand, the old art has heart, man. You can see the rough textures and it's just unique looking. I like both, but while in game I prefer the newer works, while looking at the work separately, I prefer the old. Weird take, I know. 
Something that is universally praised with Chrono Cross is its musical score, done by the legendary Yasunori Mitsuda, known for doing Chrono Trigger, Xenogears, and lending a helping hand to some Xeno games. Chrono Cross's soundtrack is nothing short of amazing, a beautiful OST to complement a gorgeous game. I love a lot of area themes, I think that's where it personally excels for me. Chrono Cross isn't a big world, so it's important to make each place memorable, and it did so through its music. You'll be experiencing various battle themes, even town themes change, it's a solid OST. A real shame the original OST wasn't packaged with this remaster. I think the opening is my favorite song, which is sad because nothing else that played topped it, but if we're thinking that's cheating, then the overworld music feels of time in the homeworld, clearly an arranged tropical take of Chrono Trigger's theme. Cross is such a weird game and difficult to recommend, especially this remaster that honestly feels like an enhanced port. On one hand, the fast forward and auto battling features were great, but then we have the combat lag and the half assed graphical enhancements and the lack of original music. Debating if it's a good port aside, the story of Chrono Cross was incredibly all over. I really feel like my brain was working overtime trying to put this mess of a plot together. And even though I popped off about all the shit that's missable and how frustrating it was, that also means there are tons of stuff to discover. It just sucks being an adult with little time for replays. But the gameplay though? It was a lot of fun, super innovative, creative, and with the help of following through character side quests is what really kept me playing. If you liked my takeaway of Chrono Cross, perhaps you'll enjoy my thoughts on Chrono Trigger. Or if you just want to check out more time traveling games I reviewed, Radiant Historia. Highly recommend that game, by the way. Anywho, thank you so much for watching, and be sure to join the Patreon, join the Discord, get early access to videos and postcards. Mwah!